Hi there, this is Out Dog Gear Chat, um, episode 21. First aid kits, I've got an ouchie. I think we, 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 that needs more work. We, it's not as innuendo ish as, as it normally is. As, as always, I'm joined by Cathy. Hello, all right. Hi, Wayne. Yeah, 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 I'm fine. Uh, I'm Cathy and I'm uh, owner and director of the Joe Brown Shops and the Climber Shop in Ambleside. Um, and we have uh, a very distinguished guest with us today. We have uh, here to talk about, well, <laughs> Uh, uh, much more technical injuries probably than an ouchie. Um, we have Dr. Will Duffin, who is Joint Medical Director for World Extreme Medicine and fresh back from three months uh, on expedition in Fiji. So uh, welcome, Will. A distinguished guest. Well, that's high praise indeed. Thanks, <laughs> Kathy and Wayne, for, for having me. Absolute pleasure. Lo lovely to meet you. Was when, when Cathy said that you were going to be coming, I was really excited about speaking to you for, on, all, on all sorts of levels. Did a bit of LinkedIn stalking last week, I think it was as well, to, to, to check, check out your background. So I guess lo launching in straight away, why should I carry a first aid kit? We'll start off with that nice, easy question for you. I think why, why, why should we carry a personal first aid kit, maybe in a different context? Well, let me start with a story. When I finished med school at 24, I was bestowed with lots of medical wisdom, but well, some medical knowledge, but not wisdom or common sense. Uh, and I went on a, um, a kind of frontier surf trip around the southern trip of Sumatra on motorbikes, trying to access some remote unsurfed spots. And um, it was a great adventure, uh, but I didn't really take any medical supplies uh, or engage in any kind of meaningful self-care. Uh, my body took a complete beating. I sustained like, nasty motorbike exhaust burns reef cuts and injuries when I kept falling off the bike over the rough terrain. All my runes got infected. And uh, when I came back, my body was just in a complete mess. And I realized that I needed to look after myself better. And I think you know, injuries, um, an illness on any kind of expedition or endeavor in the outdoors is a very real thing. It can be trip ending and small things become big things in, in wild places. And a first aid kit, it enables you, it adds that additional margin of safety. It enables you to push the envelope that little bit further because you, you know you've got that, uh, that there uh, to, to help you. Um, and I see, you know, I, I've come to see, and as a more responsible adult, uh, you know, basic first aid provision, it's like cli closing the gate behind you on a country path. It's part of responsible outdoorsmanship. And it might not just be for your personal use. Remember, you may be called upon to help a fellow climber or hiker at any moment. And having a kit transforms that kind of situation from uh, where, you know, oh shit, we've got a problem to here's an opportunity where I can help someone. Um, and because of the work I do now, everyone expects me to have some kind of kit with me wherever I am, even if it's <laughs> at the pub. So I, I never want to be caught short with that one. <laughs> yeah, but that's I was going to say, sorry, Kathy, yeah, that, that's okay. a really good point for me, is that be, being able to, to help others out. And that, you know, I did my um, mountain leaders training about a few years, a few years ago now. Sorry, my dog's just barking in the background. I think the host is just arrived. Um, the, yeah, I did my mountain leader training a few, a few years ago now. And that, that was one of the things was don't ever go out and not be able to deal with anything that you come across. Um, and yeah, it is outdoor, outdoorsmanship, I guess, isn't it? Or outdoor personship. Is that that doesn't sound quite right? Just excuse me a minute. I'm just on. I think uh, if you sort of read back in the old kind of mountaineering books of uh, of old, and um, there's always stories of uh, if someone's in trouble, um, people on the ground help out. And uh, and I think you know that that that's true now. If you look, that's the absolute basis for our mountain rescue teams, who are all volunteers. They all give their time willingly to go and help others um, who are in distress. And uh, and obviously the RNLI as well out on the coast, the Coast Guard. Um, so uh, so yeah, absolutely. I think it's really really important that you can uh, you can be there and help. But it's probably not worth carrying a first aid kit without knowing how to use the stuff in it. I think that's fair to say, is that Will? That's a, it's a great point, Cathy. And I think it's, uh, as a general rule, you should only administer treatments or medicines within your own skill level and competency. So yeah, everyone has to tailor the kit uh, accordingly. Um, and you know, if you're going to a very remote or risky environment and, and you're not taking um, a qualified medic with you, then there are lots of great courses you can do to upskill yourself in, in uh, your wilderness, first aid, uh, et cetera. And, and that, that was, yeah, that was, so 
put the point that I wanted to make about my ML training, I think really was doing, having, having that, you know, your first aid, getting that outdoor experience backed up with a, a specific outdoor first aid course, because the it's very, very different to, um, to the first aid in the workplace training, isn't it? You know, there's that, oh, stick a plaster on it, we're all right, yeah, we'll call yeah. an ambulance or whatever. And then, but then suddenly you come across, yeah, climber that's fallen from a cliff face and you've got a head injury and it's going to be a while, like Kathy says, until a mountain rescue arrive or, yeah, yeah God forbid, you, you do need a helicopter to take something out. It's going to be a while longer still. And that that's just, I guess, in in, in my head, that's just we're talking about that in, in the mountains of uh, the United Kingdom, whereas, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, like you said, when you're on expert, Expedition. Yeah, you you are days away from help potentially, I guess. And what you've touched on there, Wayne, is the very free song of wilderness medicine. It, you know, the actual problems and, and and conditions that people bring to us are very similar to what you you may see in a regular clinic or, or ward. But it's the context that makes it fascinating. It's it's uh, how you coordinate a, a medevac, how you improvise with limited equipment, how you um, uh, coordinate a, a, a small team around that individual to, to provide safe and effective care. And th th that is, you know, it's a very, very complex and, and fascinating area with, with many, many layers of, of depth to it. But what, what we're going to try, try and focus on today is really just some practical and actionable steps that your listeners can take away uh, just to make their experience in the outdoors that little bit safer. Brilliant. And what, what so on a, a very, um, a very simple level, then what should I be sticking in my first aid kit, do you think? Because as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a hiker, a runner, a climber or something like that, on my, on my personal first aid kit, what's, what would be essentials that you think could stick in there? So it, I mean, a first aid kit is a very kind of personal thing and it needs to be customized to what activity you're doing, the group that you're with, the duration of the trip. Uh, any existing medical conditions in the group, the skill set of those in the group. And you really, really need a combination of things that can treat both common minor ailments and also maybe a few things that could save a life in a rare uh, emergency. I would say as a bare minimum, say in the, U in the hills in the UK, a, a couple of essential items you might want to throw in there would be some nitrile gloves, uh, if, you, if you're treating, working with a blood, uh, contaminated body fluids and blood, et cetera. Bit of non-sterile gauze, very, very helpful for mopping up wounds and cleaning things. Some kind of antiseptic. Uh, I personally take betadine uh, in a little eyedropper. Works really well. You know, kind of op Optrex, I think. I empty that out and put that in there. Some band-aids, some basic dressings, maybe a crepe bandage and some something to secure that in place, like safety pins or, or zinc oxide tape cohesive bandage is so useful i'm just holding one up to the camera here you can you can buy this over the counter it sticks to itself and that's just really good for all kinds of stuff dressings and uh strapping an ankle etc uh blister care is pretty essential something like compede mole skin i mean there's uh, we could talk to to yeah, the loads of brown. <laughs> blisters, yeah, but, yeah um some simple analgesia paracetamol would be the go-to right if it's an endurance type event, avoid ibuprofen. There's some safety concerns. I, I was just going to say that we've spoken about that previously in the right. downsides. And yeah, no, well, sort of mutual friends, I think, have fallen foul of that in ultras, particularly as far as yeah, potential kidney failure, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway. Yeah. So the, so the stress placed on the body. If, I mean, it's okay, I think, if, if it's just a, a hike in the, in, in the hills, but if anything that's putting stress, physiological stress on the body, risk of low, low salt, hyponatremia, kidney injury. Irritation, stomach lining, uh, and, and uh, bleeding in the stomach, you know, all those risks are, are amplified. Um, so, And it can delay recovery from injury, particularly if people are, are running through the pain using non steroidals like ibuprofen. So definitely avoid those in, in those contexts. Cool. And yeah, I know, yeah, from a personal perspective, I know uh, taking brufen through, yeah, no, yeah it, it's, it's given me bad gut issues on, on, on yeah on all sorts of levels both uh, during and after uh, uh, yeah um, endurance activity just just go back to um, it, um hyp hypnotremia again was that was that linked to ibuprofen so i knew it was that, that yes you, it, yeah, hypnotremia that, can be okay. yes yeah 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 cool so um, and, have to explain to me what that is sorry, oh, no, sorry, so, sorry no, yeah sorry, well that was where i was levels, going sorry yeah. sorry yeah. sorry it's getting it's already getting too technical i knew this would happen i'm sorry yeah <laughs> So what is it in layman's terms? Low, 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 so, low blood salt levels. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Got, it's it's got, yeah. not an uncommon problem in, in endurance athletes. 
yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and I guess the flip side, as I'm finding out at the moment, I'm doing a fair bit of swimming is the other way, is hyper here, isn't it? Where yeah. you're getting almost too much salt into your system, and you can't that that balance of hydration in your body just doesn't work. Yeah. Is, is I guess is the easiest way to explain yeah. Yeah. explain what the that trick means. there, Wayne, is not to drink the sea while you're swimming in it. Probably <laughs> you're doing a lot of sea training don't, at the moment. I'd, no, I'd lay don't, off. Don't, yeah, don't, don't, don't. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's another story. We'll get into jellyfish and everything. Then, then. yeah. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you, men you mentioned Will about um, different um, different first aid kits, almost for different activities. Or and is, would, do you think is that is that a repacking exercise, or is it almost like if I am going walking, I'll have one. If I've got climbing, I'll have another one. Yeah, I think it's good to customize it to what you're doing. I mean, I've just got a box of of equipment. I just kind of draw from that, and I pack. I like that. Depending on what I'm doing, I've got kind of like a Pelly, a Pelly style case with a waterproof o-ring in it but if, if, if it's more kind of vehicle based stuff i can that's the highest level of protection but if i'm prioritizing something which is lightweight then i tend to use sandwich bags um or dry bags to put my kit in and uh, you know, it really depends on the duration the number of the group you have and, and what you're doing and, and you can just you know, pick a mix of the right thing for, for that activity yeah, we've got um, a huge range and uh, beautiful little red bags on our wall, and they've all got their own names, right down to doggy first aid kits as Very well. Good, actually. I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's literally there's a hiking first aid kit, there's a blister pack, there's a a mountain first aid kit, a group first aid kit for different numbers of people. So you can literally buy off the peg, um, but of course there's always going to be a risk that there's loads of stuff in there that you don't necessarily need. So we do also sell, uh, I think it's adventure medical bags um which they, they are literally a, a zipped uh, water resistant bag but they've got so many different pouches and if you're out with a group you can just know exactly where the stuff is that you need so you can access that in a hurry um i know over the years we've um done the same as as you will we've got i've got my little running first aid kit that sits in my running bag and that is literally yeah. a little plastic sandwich bag with blister stuff with paracetamol with steri strips and um uh, uh normally ginger tablets as well to stem any nausea um right through to um our hill walking first aid kit which is a bit more robust it's got pen it's got paper it's got extra bits and pieces in gloves as you said um the the van kit for when we're out and about has got all sorts in that's in a giant margarine tub um uh, and then we've got one for kayaking uh, <laughs> all different they, they've just evolved over the years if we're traveling with kids if we're traveling further afield, we've got a sterile needle kit and we sell those as well. Um, so uh, everything that you can, can possibly need really. I did have one question, Will, because the sterile needle kits have, uh, or in fact, all um, first aid kit equipment has a, like a use by date on it, um, which I can completely understand for things like pills and, and tablets and medicines and, and things like that. Um, but why would uh, sterile needle kits have a use by date on yeah so I mean, it's just that the packaging degrades oh, and okay. eventually holes will form and it will no longer be sterile yeah 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 oh good that that answers that one because i was like well there's metal yeah. surely in plastic there's not a lot to go wrong here but uh... yeah they, they are useful i think particularly in uh, low resource settings in you know mm. in countries where you, know, you can't rely upon uh, the, the local health facilities that they're using sterile equipment yeah. less of an issue i think nowadays um but you know definitely something you'd want in a particularly in a remote area overseas yeah yeah i think um, nowadays if we're traveling with the kids in particular we'll carry it if we're carrying ourselves if we're traveling somewhere like india if we're not going far from the roadhead the healthcare quality is very very good um so we probably wouldn't worry so much whereas 20 years ago we wouldn't you yeah. know they would have been in first yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I was it's that similar line of question into what, to what, to what I had in my head as well is it is about uh, checking your first aid kit because I, I have been guilty about, as, as Cathy was just describing, having our first aid kit. So, a, well, a, a little red number that I just chucked in my running pack and it stayed there for 18 months. And then 18 months later, I need, I need a, a blister plaster and I open yeah. it and it's just. <laughs> <laughs> green brown etc yeah, yeah. so it's checking up on the contents on a fairly regular basis i guess isn't it yeah and especially if you've got a larger kit and you know we, we run an exhibition medicine company so we know we've, we've got kits that we're we're sending all over the world and uh you know we have to we have someone dedicated that, that does an inventory and they go through the kit 
and check for expiry dates, uh, make sure it's all in stock and up to date. And so, yeah, yeah, you, you, did, you did a bit of description there about sort of essentials that you'd carry. What And, and Cathy, you were just saying about like, yeah, if we're traveling to India or further afield, remoter areas, what what sort of other stuff would we would we be including in that? I'm guessing there's potential for including additional forms of medication for whatever reason, I guess, as far as pain relief might be going. But yeah, again, I mean, the sky's the limit. This is the thing. Yeah. It's always this tension between wanting to take the kitchen sink and being prepared for every eventuality, like every good boy scout or girl scout, but also being mindful of, of space and weight restrictions. Um, I mean, additional, so we've talked about, uh, you know, basic wound care. We've talked about simple analgesia like paracetamol, and practical stuff but if you had a little bit more space and you perhaps were doing a more remote longer duration trip and you wanted some extra capabilities extra things I might think about packing would be some more advanced wound closure such as steri strips or if it was me I'd take a suture kit with me some advanced dressings and burns dressings that kind of things I, I take some antibiotics to cover wound infections which are quite common particularly in tropical settings. Splinting is very, very useful for, for trauma, um, particularly you know, upper limb trauma, fallen outstretched hand or you know, ankles. You know, think something like a simple SAM splint. I'm sure we've come across those. Uh, have you come across SAM splints before? I don't think yeah. so, no. no. Yeah. Uh, Kathy's nodding. Yeah, it's yeah. just a, a, uh, a foam splint with a malleable alloy core that you can use uh, on uh, pretty much anywhere on the body. It just right. molds to that body part and it, it can be a real lifesaver uh, if, if you have a fracture in a, in a remote environment. Triangular bandage is very good. Uh, maybe some the stronger staple, analgesia. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a real staple. So, so something with codeine in uh, if, if you wanted. And then some emergency stuff can be useful. So we've talked mostly about wound care and, and minor illness there, but you can get, can, you, know, you need to be prepared for more major emergencies. So a small pocket mask to, to be able to give ventilation breaths and CPR, mm. maybe some adrenaline to, to manage anaphylaxis, hemostatic bandages like sea locks for massive hemorrhage. And also the other thing I, I tend to carry is a nasopharyngeal airway or an airway adjunct. If someone's unconscious, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a small thing that can really uh, change the outcome. I mean, the list goes on. I could, I could go on mm. for days on this, but those are just a, a few things, a, few, a bit of food for thought there on, on the kind of things you might like to, to throw in your bag. I'm going to dial this point... back down, sorry, because uh, the sorry. other thing that has, has now actually just very recently become a staple across all of our little first aid kits in our household is a tick remover because yeah, they yeah. just are getting everywhere. Oh, my word, the last few years um, from never really sort of seeing them very often um, to like, yeah, just every time. Well, it, it, every so time I, we get back from a I run. just I live on the edge of Dartmoor and I got Lyme disease just last year. I come back from... Oh, the overnight on the moors and I've just literally covered in ticks now and I never yeah. that never used to happen there's, no. there's definitely been a change there and I've I got, yeah. <laughs> I, I got the antibiotics it's all treated it's fine but yeah, yeah. getting those those little bastards off early is, is, uh, is highly desirable it's essential yeah well that's, yeah. It, that's right I, I get to, I must get bitten 20 odd times a year in, in a different stage so I'm well used to plucking those out but it does seem <laughs> to be people who aren't who aren't uh, yeah as, 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 as aware of them really so yeah it's, it's fairly crucial i was talking to a guy yeah the other day who'd, who'd um, contracted lyme disease as a result of those so it's yeah we won't go into that in any more detail but it's worth checking out um there's a there's a charity called the lyme disease co cause cardwell lyme disease co that are doing mm. loads of work on awareness at the moment and testing uh, around the country so it's worth 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 check, checking yeah, them out really small really cheap dead easy to use and they just get yeah. the little devils spawn out your skin oh they're disgusting <laughs> yeah, do, well yeah i got one from your shop the other day actually kathy after <laughs> removing three last weekend from different people anyway uh yeah the, um, the key is there when i'll just mention this this is the top tip you need to get the tweezers or the tick tick remover device whatever it is really close to the mouth parts of the skin and just pull it straight out no yeah, twisting yeah. you just yeah. want to leave nothing in in the skin yeah and and don't don't listen to people telling you to rub alcohol or Vaseline yeah. or anything or lighters like that. Or, at all. Yeah. Yeah, just, or yeah, don't None try and burn them out. No, just get it. Just yeah, old fashioned yeah. tweezers at the very just at it. the very least. Well, uh, yeah, but then the tick cards are great for that or, or stuff yeah, that you can get good. from your vets. Um, are, are absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, I'll just so we we've gone from sort of what we're wavering from one extreme to the other. I think I'd, I'd just done the, a lifeguarding qualification recently. And one of the things that really came out of that, to be honest, to be perfectly honest, was two essentials for your first aid kit. 
one is uh, tampons or um, or um, you know t sanitary towel san sanitary pads for multiple different reasons, including you can slap them on a wound. Was there, was basically there was a yeah a couple of mountain leaders had, had said they they had a really bad injury, just slap that on a on a on a leg, and and then the second one was tape. You, you mentioned zinc oxide tape, mm. but mm. duct tape or gaffer tape yeah. to try and and we again, Kathy, we've spoken about that before, haven't we? I've got them wrapped around my walking poles just as a as a, yeah. yeah to for for multiple reasons. But chuck it, chucking those in your first aid kit for, and, for and all tampons number of are, are amazing for fire lighting as well, aren't they? With yeah, the well, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, worth considering those if you if you're listening and you haven't got them in your in your first aid kit as Although well as using. They're quite painful to remove if applied to a nosebleed up a nostril i'm not sure that's necessarily yeah. <laughs> a good thing to do <laughs> Brilliant. But, but yeah i guess it's, it's it's using that is you know knowing how to use everything in your first aid kit is it, yeah it's having that practical stuff that you can use for all sorts of uh, different um uh, different purposes um i suppose a key point there is improvisation will as well you were saying about sam splints and things like that uh, triangular bandages if if you're out and about and you do end up um with a, an injury to your wrist um and to your arm if you're using walking poles and a buff you can create something equally as effective just to get you down to the road really yeah. Um, it, um yeah i mean the, the most important component of your first aid kit is between your ears that you and it's your ability to <laughs> adapt it, it, it to the situation in that moment and i there's something with key steel we teach on our, all our courses is how to use bit, certain bits of kit in multiple with multiple different uses and to use the environment around you uh, um uh, is assets and uh, resources all around you you just know where, where to look so like say walking pole sticks they make brilliant splints mm -hmm. yeah. um and there's loads of examples of that in the wilderness medicine um and yeah i guess there's an important piece of tech here first important piece of kit as far as your phone and that in the, the 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 uses of that as well but yeah, there's yeah. One of the questions that we have is, yeah, do I just need a phone for emergencies in the UK? Um, I suppose we've partly answered that question, haven't we, by saying we we still even in we don't need to be that remote areas of the country really. We we might be a long way away from, you know, it's going to be yeah a, a life threatening amount of time away from hell. I know I, I came across a guy over at Winlatter cycling. He was on a road, gone around the corner. It was icy and had broken his leg, and we were sat there for two hours waiting for for an ambulance to arrive you know the nearest ambulance station the one well, the nearest hospitals carlisle which directly i think is something like 30 minutes away but they were, they were they were talking about having to get a helicopter in to extract him um yeah from 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 you know from a road from a, ma a major a road and near near winlatter so i think I, yeah between. phones have come on a long way in the last five ten years i mean there was a, a concern at the outset when they were being used more in the outdoors that the battery life was poor that they were prone to water damage i mean the, the kind of current generation of phones are pretty you know, they're waterproof they're pretty solid you know they are quite robust and reliable particularly if you put them in a solid case mm. um and you know we we you've got they're all equipped with GPS now, and you know you can summon help and, and you and network coverage across the UK, even in the national parks, is now pretty amazing. So that really changed the landscape. It's changed the nature of mobile technology and, and its its application in the outdoors. I think dramatically. However, having said that, you should never rely on one method of communication. Two is one, one is none. If your phone fails. You're left with nothing. So I think we've, you've always got to consider a backup option, whether that's VHF radio or personal locator beacon or just sending a, a, a runner to, to call for help. And you think of where, what your alternative is, you know, if, if you do need to help, you need, you need help and you're, you're out in the wild. And, and that telling people where you are going and what time you're expecting to be back, et cetera. Yeah. Et cetera. It's real. Yeah, I guess for, for us, it's real. Uh, simple stuff but it's, uh, and st I'm still seeing a lot of my, my sort of friends families extend, extend yeah ex extended network I guess is still forgetting that you know they're going off on their own and and then suddenly there's this flurry of people trying to try trying to locate them in some way shape yeah. or form. yeah and to some extent Wayne I think we you know we live in this state of hyper connectedness in day-to-day -day life there's this, this, this tacit assumption that we're always going to be able to reach out and, and and connect with people but it's not until you find yourself you know, in the depths of a valley with an injured person that you suddenly realize actually we are quite exposed here 
Well, it's, yeah, and, and again, dead interesting. Off, oh, yeah, off the the A six just near near Kendall in the South Lake District. There's yeah, there's a, uh, there's a lot lot of running around that area. There's a couple of valleys still. You you know you might be twenty minutes away away from the uh, the the main uh, a main A road when you when you're running, but suddenly there's just an absolute black spot and there's nothing at all. No, yeah. You know, this this isn't the place to get <laughs> to get hurt at all. You're a long way from help, aren't you? And um, just yeah, just mentioning on you mentioned personal locator beacons earlier on. What I've I've started using the the, the location function on WhatsApp, particularly when I'm doing swimming in the sea. And yeah, people listen. Well, I'm, I don't think the people listening that might tell me off for this when I'm going on my own. Um, um, then I will I will send somebody my location so that my, my phone is in a tow float behind me with that, you know, it's got the location pinging for, for sort of eight hours. That's a really useful, useful thing for, for, uh, for reassurance, I guess. Yeah. I do the same, but yeah, yeah but, but it does drain the battery obviously, because you need location services on it pinging away constantly and so on. So it's, but yeah, so that, that, that needs bearing in mind. Um, yeah. So we, we were, we were going to ask about, uh, extreme em emergency stuff are there any additional things that i need to carry in my pack so we've done we've done the, the sort of the medical angle we yeah we've mentioned the the sort of the 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 the, ta the tampons and the and and duct tape but is there anything else that we should be carrying in our pack do you I mean, think uh, yeah some kind of practical stuff i would say uh a uh, foil blanket or blizzard type bag is essential because as soon as someone stops and they get cold and that you, you can get lots of secondary problems when, when someone gets injured. So that's a pretty essential a head torch. Very important. Often you're treating someone in quite low light conditions and you, it's really difficult and you can't see what you're doing. So head torch just to treat the casualty, but also to coordinate medevac. And, you know, you may be out during the day and you know, the, the, the night comes in and that completely changes everything. So even for short day hikes, I always take a, a head torch to anticipate being out longer than, than, than I'd planned. Um, Another top tip I'll give you is that one of the problems with uh, blister packs of medicines is that they, they they get damaged and all the, the tablets pop out and then they degrade. I, I put sellotape over the back of all of them just to keep them protected. And you can peel it off when you when you pop them out. It just it just adds a bit of durability. Oh, that's a good one. Using yeah, that. It is. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's it. I've, the amount of times I have gone to use paracetamol and it's all, they're, they're just all knackered and uh, yeah, they've yeah, just dissolved all open and, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> One one of the things for for me there as well is about like you know I've always carried stuff like uh, dextrosol tablets for example um, you know if if people are even even if people are just flagging a little bit to be perfectly honest giving them that little little boost and but then yeah we get into the the sort of the the into the, the realms of diabetes I guess there as well as as far as 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 establishing whether people are having what's it hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia as well isn't it is that low blood blood sugars are really super high blood sugars but um and the, the old the old-fashioned boiled sweets as as, <laughs> as, as, as all, all yeah. the fell runners say you know yeah. carry carry yeah carry some so i don't know even like little bits of nutrition i know this is, this is coming from uh, being particularly being being a dad i guess and keeping <laughs> yeah. keeping the kids fed with sugar all along the way <laughs> Um, I mean, for, fortunately, when we, it's quite common to experience bonking, uh, you know, low blood sugars when you know, during endurance events, uh, but it's very rare for that to become dangerously low in outside the context of diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it, it can make people very weak and listless and uh, some jelly babies will really pep them up. But you're unlikely to be managing a dangerous hypoglycemia um, unless that person you know, has, has other medical uh, problems. Yeah, sorry. No, one, one thing you did say, Will, and I think it's important, a lot of people can um, forget just how quickly you chill down. Um, if you do fall over, if you're out running in particular, um, there's just a, a whole kind of drift towards lighter and lighter and lighter weight equipment. Um, and you can very quickly find yourself, particularly if you're running in the winter, uh, you, you just stop for a very short amount of time, even if you're just stopping to... Um, change a layer or something or just to have a bite of food you chill down quickly so if you trip and if you put shock into that uh, equation as well um and uh, you haven't got that blizzard bag with you or a another layer or food which i guess is probably the best yeah. thing to get into you as quickly as possible to to create that heat 
um then it, it, it yeah it's scary how quickly you lose heat yeah i mean like, um, like many people i'm an avid gram chase i've got kitchen scales i weigh everything i'm trying to keep my pack weight down there's definitely been a trend in recent years towards a more faster night style of of packing um but yeah you have to have that margin of safety and there's certain non-negotiables i think you have yeah. to consider the what ifs yeah. uh because great if you're moving quickly over the terrain and you're, you're generating body heat and everything's going to plan you'll you'll be fine but the moment something happens you have to stop and you you, yeah. you, you can really run into trouble just like like you said there yeah. Kathy. yeah yeah and so, with the kids as well they tend to chill down very yeah. very quickly so we've always carried a little boffy bag so we have our sandwiches yeah. in that and they make a tremendous difference if you're out. I, I just I use those just for map reading in bad weather. You just get in <laughs> yeah. them and just have a snack break and you can just all get inside and it's quite a bit, a bit of fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's great. And they're not much. I mean, they're ultra light. They're, they're, they're two to three hundred grams for a two, three man bothy, bothy bag. I, and, you know, it's not much for weight penalty, is it? No, not at all. Not at all. You can just all, all sit inside it and, as you say, every sandwich is have a, have a natter and uh, uh, out you go and get blasted again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, we, yeah, we've got we've just, we've just got a few minutes left of, of, of chat now. And uh, um, your bliss, blisters, give it, what's, um, let, let's talk more specifically about blisters. We mentioned the, the sort of yeah. blister plasters and what yeah. if, if, if I'm on the move and I'm, yeah, my, my, my shoes, my boots are rubbing, um what's yeah and what's what's the what's what would you your advice be then okay i'll give i'll give you the lowdown on blisters in 60 seconds you ready yeah cool. fantastic all right cool. here we go okay the, the biggest thing i can uh, i can say is prevention good fitting footwear manufacturer whose last fits with your foot i've got scarper feet so i tend to go with those breaking in your boots playing around with volume insoles lacing techniques um anticipating your feet will swell over longer duration so sizing up changing your socks regularly sock liners are brilliant i use those uh, and using a kind of wool synthetic blend with good wicking properties um uh and, and moving towards i think it's been a trend away from more rigid plastic compatible uh, crampon compatible boots towards more trainer style uh, looser foot um uh, more, uh, more forgiving malleable. footwear should i say malleable footwear yeah uh, drying out your feet in the evening so they don't get wet and macerated and maybe lagging your feet in petroleum jelly or, uh, or pseudocreme before you you head out so and all of those things are really the most important thing about blister care it's all about prevention um, and then when you develop hot spots when things start to rub and you notice it then stopping and dealing with that early when you do get blisters um, I, I mean, there's a myriad of different dressings out there, and I'm, I'm not going to go into massive detail, particularly find things like mole skin or mole foam, very useful. Compede is excellent. Uh, I don't tend to use uh, zinc oxide tape anymore because it's too rigid, and I, I quite like K-tape, kinesio tape, because mm -hmm. it's flexible and it's got great adhesion. And any taping you put on, make sure you cut, you round the corners with the scissors to reduce peeling. Antibiotic ointment can be quite nice to put under the, the dressing. Everyone asks about popping blisters. Generally, don't do it unless you have to, unless it's over a pressure point. You can often make a little donut style um, pressure relieving thing with a, with a, with a mole skin. And they right. often just pop on their own. Um, but yeah, that's, that's blister care in 60 seconds. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I guess the thing with um, kinesio tape and uh, compi is once it's on, it's on. <laughs> you know that yeah. you, you need to you need to be aware of that if you're going to be yeah. sticking it on your skin it's going to take a bit of a while to to get off though so yeah just my personal uh horrific experience is going into that so yeah we've got less than a minute to go uh of, of, of the chat now so yeah i guess thanks will it's been ama amazing to speak to you um from my perspective yeah and i love, love listening to you um could speak for hours i know is it yeah Kathy have you got any 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 final no thank you very much for your time well we really appreciate that and um uh, I know we work with World Extreme Medicine and uh, we're very proud to have that affiliation um but we've got more information on blisters in particular on our Joe Brown Outdoor Academy website and for all your medical needs for the outdoors you can go to www.climbers-shop.com <laughs>